Welcome to the Book of Life, a show about Jewish books, music, film, and web. I'm Heidi Estrin. The Book of Life is a podcast service of the Feldman Library at Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida. Additional support comes from the Association of Jewish Libraries. Judy Blundell has written over a hundred books under various pen names, but she won the National Book Award with her first book in her own name. The book is called What I Saw and How I Lied, and it's a noir-inspired mystery and coming-of-age story set in post-World War II Palm Beach, Florida. Like real life, the story is complex, multi-layered, and not easy to sum up. But just to give you an idea, it's the story of Evie Spooner, whose stepfather Joe has returned from the war and whisks Evie and her mother off on a spur-of-the-moment vacation to Florida. Their vacation is shadowed by a mysterious and handsome stranger who knew Joe in the army. Bit by bit, Evie starts to uncover the dark connections between the adults in her life. I spoke to Judy Blundell by phone at her home in Katona, New York. Judy, you've written many, many books under pen names, Mm -hmm. in particular a lot of Star Wars tie-ins under the name Jude Watson. What made you break out of that mold to do something different? Well, I always credit my editor, David Levithan, at Scholastic. Together, we've done about 40, he counted, about 47 books. And and he just said to me one day, write something and bring it to me. And I said, what are you looking for? Which is a writer like me, a writer for hire usually asks their editor. And he said, no, no, no. Write something that you want to write. And I said, well, I do have this idea. <laughs> he said, go. And that's how I think I got the courage to actually sit down and pull this idea together and show it to David. Was this kind of a one-time thing to break away from the work for hire, or are you going to be writing more of your own ideas? Oh, I'm definitely going to write another, I'm going to continue to write as Judy Blundell, but um, I also really enjoy writing as Jude Watson. I, I write mostly middle grade, and it's work that's important to me because it's an age where boys start reading, and we're losing boys to reading all the time, so I really mm-hmm. enjoy writing as Jude Watson. I'm, I'm working on this series called 39 Clues, so I'm going to continue to do both. What was the genesis for what I saw and how I lied? Uh, I lived in Florida for about five years in the, in the Palm Beach area, and while I was living there, I woke up in the middle of the night with a terrible headache, and when writers have terrible headaches, they often think they're aneurysms because we're all basically hypochondriacs. So <laughs> I was trying to <laughs> distract myself from this headache, and I was awake in the middle of the night, and this image came to me of a young girl playing solitaire in a hotel lobby. And I was awake anyway, so for the rest of the night, I told myself the story of who she was and what she was doing there. And the compulsion to tell that story drove the book, but it took me another five years to actually write it and to pull all the other threads into the book that I needed. You were talking about the dream that you had, the image that came to you in the middle of the night and how you wanted to tell the story of this girl, but there are so many other parts of it that Mm -hmm. aren't really about a hotel in Florida. Where did those other elements come from? When I figured out that it was really a post-war story, I knew that I couldn't set a book in 1947 in Palm Beach without dealing with anti-Semitism. I, I just I just knew it had to be there in some fashion, but it wasn't until I really started thinking about this mysterious couple, the Graysons, who also had a secret, that I realized that this would be the perfect secret to have that would also tie into the fact that Evie's father had been involved in the gold train in, in Austria, because as soon as I read the story of the gold train, that clicked it for me. I knew exactly that that was going to be the fulcrum of his secret because it's such an unbelievable story. I think the amount of rationalization that people can have about stealing something from dead people is immense. And so these two soldiers got together and thought, well, here's a warehouse full of stuff. Nobody's going to miss it. Back up and talk a little about the gold train for anybody who isn't aware of that story. Uh, It happened in Hungary very near the end of the war, when the Jews were rounded up and and had to give over all their property. It was all loaded onto this train, 
and it just took off. And the, the war was ending. So in the process of the war ending, the train just kept going all, all the way through Europe until it finally, post-war, ended up in Salzburg. And it took a while for the Americans to get a hold of it and realize what they had, and they didn't know what to do with it. So they just had this warehouse full of stuff. Some of the officers would requisition some of it for their offices, these beautiful rugs and silverware and all this kind of stuff. And eventually, some of it was auctioned off in Sotheby's in, I think, 1948. Mm-hmm. And explain a little how that works into the story. Well, Evie's stepfather, Joe, and Peter Coleridge, who is the mysterious stranger, both are in Salzburg, post-war Salzburg, still in the army, and they decide to steal what they can. Some gold dust was actually stolen and was never traced. So I just had, and this is definitely a spoiler if you read this book, but um, (laughs) I just had some of my characters actually successfully steal. And, you know, one of the GIs goes back to the States and uses it to start a business and spends most of the money, so the other GI comes after him. Why was anti-Semitism a theme that you wanted to explore, or did it just evolve out of the way the story was coming together? Um, My husband was a curator at the Norton Museum of Art, and I spent a lot of time in Palm Beach. And there was one specific thing that really stuck in my head, and I'm not going to name names, but I was reading an article about one of those old name Palm Beach, I guess you would call her a dowager. She was older, and it was a profile piece about her in the shiny shoes. She told a story, I guess it was back in the 60s, that her son brought a friend home from college, and they played tennis at one of the clubs in Palm Beach and then had lunch afterwards. And the manager of the club called her and said, and I'm sure in a sort of smarmy, euphemistic way, um, I'm sorry, madam, but your son brought someone inappropriate. You know, he had brought someone Jewish, and he had eaten in the club, in the Everglades Club. And she said that she dressed him down and said, well, he's a guest of mine, and I'm a, I'm a member of the club, and therefore any guest of mine should be welcome at the club. And it was a very self-congratulatory tone, mm-hmm. which the journalist took as well about how progressive she was. And I was reading this in a complete state. I was so incredulous. I was thinking to myself, you belong to a restricted club. <laughs> you pay dues to a restricted club. And, and she's congratulating herself. And the reporter isn't calling her on it. And the whole piece, it made such a huge impression on me because I thought that is the amount of disconnect. This is the part of anti-Semitism that is all, it's not the systemic part, which is, horrible and horrifying. This is the part that is horrifying to me because it's so insidious. It's that disconnect. And so that was something I wanted to be in this book as well, that Evie makes that connection. She makes that connection. Boom. In the beginning of the book, her best friend does this very casual but kind of cruel action to another girl from the neighborhood who's Jewish. And she doesn't make that connection until much later in the book. I was going to ask you about that. How does Evie's own attitude about prejudice mature during the story? Well, very few people think of themselves as prejudiced and don't see the prejudices that they grow up with that swirls around them in the world that they live in. And Evie is definitely that way. She grows up Catholic in Queens, and I don't think she really thought about the war in terms of that. You know, when she says, we knew about the camps, but we didn't want to think about it. We wanted to start over. You know, everybody wanted a new car and a new radio, and we were tired of thinking about terrible things. And so her evolution through the book is she's got to turn around and face horrible things. And some of those horrible things are people who are very close to her who aren't telling her the truth. That's why it's a coming-of-age story within the framework of this kind of suspense, film noir atmosphere. The book has very often been compared to a film noir movie, and I was wondering if that was intentional. 
Uh, it wasn't intentional in the very beginning, but just naturally the mood of 1947. When I first started the book, my conception of the post-war years was everybody came home and all of a sudden the factories were retooled for consumer goods and the economy went booming and it was a time of great optimism in American life, which is true. That is definitely part of the post-war American mood. But on the other hand, one of the things I did to do research was only read books that were either written during that period or earlier or listen to music from that period. And there there's this great strain of anxiety and sometimes even despair in the books written around that period. And I'm thinking of writers like James Jones, who wrote Some Came Running, which takes place post-war America, or more famously, um, Gentleman's Agreement. So once I started thinking about that post-war mood, I, and then I sort of looked at my plot and I thought, oh my gosh, look what I have. I've got a blonde and a off-season hotel and these mysterious people. And I thought, it really has the trappings of a film noir. And wouldn't it be interesting to put, instead of, you know, Sam Spade or some hard-boiled detective, to put a 15-year-old girl in the middle of that and have her try to make sense of what's going on around her. I, I don't really work with, well, while I listen to music, like I find that distracting, but for this book, I did. And listening to the music from the 40s really gives you a flavor of the times and how romantic it was, too. And um, another thing I did was my mother is in her 80s, and I asked her to teach me the Lindy. <laughs> and it never made it into the book, but I just... You know, I put on some Glenn Miller or something, and she started teaching me the steps. And, you know, I'm not a good dancer, but the Lindy isn't hard to learn. But I noticed as she was teaching it, it to me that we moved completely differently. Just the way she moved her hips and her knees and her legs, I saw the 40s. I saw 40s in just the way she did the Lindy, and I could not reproduce that. And... I thought that was really interesting because it made me really think about how each time has its own rhythm. And that, to me, translated into also how people spoke and the rhythm of how they spoke. And that's when film really helps and reading literature contemporary to the time really helped. And it was really important to me to get that as right as I possibly could. You know, a couple of people have said that I, I didn't make any major mistakes, so that makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed um, when watching old movies that people just talked differently, like n not just vocabulary, but the way their voices were. Yeah, and, I, yeah. I know, absolutely. And it feels like, in this book, it feels like they're talking that way. This is also one thing that really was helpful was that my mother had saved newspapers from... Uh, Pearl Harbor all the way through VJ Day, mostly front pages, but and they're very fragile, but she had boxes of these, and that was this huge, wonderful resource to actually hold the newspapers and look through them and get a feel of the time. I was lucky. Um, I was going to ask you, you were talking about listening to music of the era. Is there any particular song that you kind of feel like, represents the book? Let me go over to my iTunes. Uh, there's a song called Long Ago and Far Away that I listen to a lot. It's very dreamy. I think it came out in 1947, actually. Yeah, Joe Stafford. Long Ago and Far Away is this very moody, very um, hopeful song about, you know, I dreamed a dream and now the dream is here beside me. It's, you know, it's very schmaltzy, but, but beautiful. <laughs> And so I listened to that because these are, are songs that Evie would have been listening to on the radio and dreaming about love. So um, that, that, I would say, was one of them, definitely. Judy Blundell, congratulations on your National Book Award, and thanks so much for speaking with us. Oh, it was such a pleasure. Thank you, Heidi. listening to a jazz rendition of Long Ago and Far Away from the Podsafe Music Network, 
played by Mike Dalfaro. Hear the version that inspired author Judy Blundell, sung by Joe Stafford, at bookoflifepodcast.com, where you can also watch a film clip from Cover Girl with Rita Hayworth and Gene Kelly, in which the song first made its debut. Now receive Book of Life episodes through your Facebook account. Look for the Book of Life at networkedblogs.com and click follow or click on the Facebook widget at bookoflifepodcast.com. The Book of Life is a podcast service of Congregation B'nai Israel of Boca Raton, Florida at cbiboca.org and is supported in part by the Association of Jewish Libraries online at jewishlibraries.org. Our background music is provided by the Freilach Makers Klezmer String Band at freilachmakers.com. Visit our podcast website at bookoflifepodcast.com or listen to the latest episode by phone at 916-313-3820. We welcome your comments and questions at bookoflifepodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and happy reading. Happy reading.